Uh, over, over to you, Mark. Welcome. All right, very good. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see this. Okay, so today um, I'm going to try and give you a sort of an instant digest of the really important stuff for the last 20,000 years in southern Peru. And as you can imagine, this has uh, been a huge joint effort from a lot of uh, people and uh, some very familiar names in this list, Miles, Dunia, and so on, and perhaps some less familiar ones of people who've just graduated with their PhDs um, who are now um, you know, making, making the rounds, uh, looking for real work and so on. And then of course, at the end there is Crystal McMichael, who's at the University of Amsterdam. So, no, didn't let me advance that way. So I'm going to start with an overview of the glacial Holocene transition, keeping it very brief. Um, I want to deal with this in terms of the, the arrival of people and megafaunal extinction, and then uh, the mid Holocene dry event and adding some thoughts about spatial complexity into that. And then, uh, so coming through to later times as a development of cultivation, of really widespread cultivation in the Andes and natural human impacts in the last thousand years. The sites I'm gonna focus on are the ones which are closest to the transect. So we don't have sites literally on the transect apart from the refugio sites at the, at the top of Manu. But we've got Lake Palatoa, which is quite close. And then we've got a bunch of sites which are back into the, the higher Andes um, or somewhat uh, more central to the Andes. I'm going to start with a, a little bit of Dunia Arego's work. And she was the one who did the Consuelo diagram. Lake Consuelo is um, on the border between Peru and Bolivia. And it's at 1300 meters elevation. And I'm putting a slide in to show you the incredible temperature change that happened between the Ice Age and the Holocene. Uh, this is a model that Miles worked out how to do based off the pollen. And we get an estimated paleo temperature change there of around about six or seven degrees Celsius. The stars superimposed are the paleo temperature estimate we get from the Hill of Six Lakes in Northern Brazil. And you can see those are pretty similar. And the Consuelo data sort of fall apart when we come into the Holocene. So I don't think any of us believe that there was really a sort of four degrees C warming in the Holocene. This is more to do with taxon taxonomic problems that we have as we get into the lowland flora where a lot of it becomes sort of family level um, things and it immediately pitches everything down to being at sea level almost, which is clearly not right. Um, but an interesting uh, extra line of data has come from BRGDGTs, these are archaeobacteria and they provide a sort of chemical signature in sediments that we can use to get a paleothermometer. It's reckoned to be pretty accurate. And um, the, the data here, this line is from the Hill of Six Lakes in northeastern Brazil. And the the calibration curve that we've had to use for this is very preliminary data. But the calibration curve is from Africa and it will get adjusted when we put in calibrations from South America. And my guess is it's going to drop that orange line right down onto the Consuelo data or at least onto the stars uh, representing the Hill of Six Lakes as well. So we're getting multiple proxies now that all point to this very strong warming happening between 20,000 years ago and about 14,000 years ago. So Tony Barnofsky put out a paper in Science in 2004 looking at the probable cause of megafaunal extinctions. And if we just concentrate on the Americas, uh, he pointed out that there were 33 genera uh, that went extinct in, in the Americas. And he color coded mostly red, meaning mostly human with a little bit of blue, possibly a bit of climate involved in there as well. And then um, a much larger extinction actually, a 50 genera going extinct in South America and this represents a more comprehensive extinction. 82% of large mammals, mammals weighing more than 100 kilograms, uh, going extinct at that time, whereas the um, North America is about 72%. Uh, 
going extinct at that time. So when Barnowski wrote this, it wasn't clear at all what the uh, cause of the extinction was. And so we wanted to investigate that from the paleo record. Is it feasible that people caused that extinction in South America? And when we started this, the earliest dates we had in the Andes were about 11,000 years ago. And today, um, we now know that there's a rock shelter has been dated at 12 and a half thousand years ago. We know, uh, obviously, what's going on on the coast is more like 15 to 18,000 years ago. And so the potential for people to have been in the Andes within the last 15,000 years or so definitely exists. Our way of tracking this is to use a dung fungus called Sporomyella. And Sporomyella, we've done enough sort of studies of modern systems to, to know that Sporomyella gives us a fairly good approximation for the amount of animals in landscape, and definitely their presence. And if, if we don't have Sporomyella, small mammals don't produce enough dung to, to generate the signal. So it becomes a fairly good proxy for megafaunal abundance presence and abundance. What it doesn't do is it doesn't say anything about diversity. So it could be just one species or many species. Angie Rosa Stavia, who's on the left here, and Brian Valencia next to her, um, were the key figures in generating the data set I'm just about to talk about. So Lake Pacucha uh, is at 3,000 meters elevation. Um, it's a sort of bowl-shaped depression, so it's a nice, easy landscape for herbivores to move around in. And uh, it was never glaciated. And, and so this lake provided us with a 26,000-year record. And you can see here uh, the curve for Sporomyella. So Sporomyella is plotted as a percentage of pollen abundance. And if you have more than 2%, it means you've got megafauna definitely in the landscape. If you um, have, as in this case, 30% abundance, it means you've got a lot of megafauna milling around on the edge of the lake. And the spores get into the lake when the animals defecate. And so, you know, that's pretty much what these animals do is they come down to water at the lake, they defecate either in the shallows or in the, in the edge of the lake, and then that material washes into the lake. And that's how we get the spores in the lake. You can see that the, uh, the numbers of individuals have seemed to be sort of bouncing up and down, even when there's a, a big abundance there. And so possibly this is, this is actually climatically linked, um, or maybe it's just a, a bit of stochastic noise in the data set. It's, it's difficult to tell. But what we do see is that around about 21,000 years ago, we start to see a strong decline in Sporomyella that sort of hits a, a bottom around about 18,000 years ago, but then it recovers. We don't know if that recovery is multiple species or one species. Right? We don't know whether there was multiple species going into it. Right? So that's, that's the problem. We've tried using DNA, uh, ancient DNA, and we're not having any success at all at getting DNA extracted from these sediments. The next, after that recovery, between sort of 18,000 and 16,000, we see a slump in Sporomyella from which it never recovers. In, in other words, this, the first big downturn is probably too early for people. And so this definitely looks like a climatically induced downturn in, in the population of 20,000 years ago. At 16,000 years ago, archeologists would say it's too early as well. And they would uh, argue that this is um, gonna have to be a climatic downturn in the population, climatically driven downturn in the population. And if you track the population on down to when it sort of hits the absolute Holocene level, then the actual extinction looks like it's about 12 and a half thousand years ago. But we have what's called this functional extinction at 2%. That number is kind of crappy. It is developed in the Midwest for dealing with cattle. But nevertheless, there's clearly something happening at around 16,000 years ago when we get down below that 2% number and it never comes back up above 2%. So what's, what's the cause of this? Well, wet conditions, warming conditions, those may have been bad for megafauna, but there's another possibility, which is that humans were just in this landscape earlier than we thought. And I'm gonna sort of shrug and say, I don't know what the answer is, but certainly I'd be looking for this from, from now on. And I'll show you in the next slide why I think it might be humans. 
So here it is. The red is the sporomyella. We're now plotting this um, sort of as we normally plot pollen diagrams, which is the oldest at the bottom and the youngest at the top. And we see that sporomyella, this is the same curve that you were just looking at, plotted differently. And here's the extinction at 16,000 years ago. And look what happens with charcoal. Now, charcoal has been very rare in this landscape, certainly not occurring regularly before this time. But from here on, it's an absolute constant feature of this landscape. That is often a human signature. And so I am you know, more than willing to believe that we do have evidence of people here at 16,000, 15.8 years uh, ago in the Andes. Another interesting thing just to note out of this is, is all, we're all, as ecologists, we're always curious as to whether the megafauna have much of an impact on the situation. I don't think they did. I think fire has a much bigger impact on this landscape. Um, what we're looking at through here is a, poor, a period which begins sort of when we still have quite a few megafauna in the record of what we think of as a no analog system. So we've got grass, we've got uh, polylepis, large amounts of polylepis, we've got um, a califer, which is a, a small tree that produces quite a lot of pollen, so it's a bit overrepresented, but nevertheless, we don't normally see it at this elevation. It's a lower, it's a lower elevation taxon usually and Podocarpus, and that combination is not a combination that we see anywhere in any of our pollen records we've looked at in, from modern times. So we think this is a, a no analog situation, probably a, com, a sort of composite or compounding reason of loss of megafauna, very rapid warming, changes in precipitation happening at the same time, which is reflected in this, these diatom curves over here, and the introduction of fire. So this is a sort of a perfect storm of all these different things coming together and it produces uh, this no analog flora, fauna, sorry, flora for a while. Marco Raksker uh, picked up this story and uh, he did some other sites. He, his PhD was partly in southeastern Brazil where he found an extinction about 12 and a half thousand years ago. But then he was also working in the Andes and so this is now um, a composite set of, of records here uh, from lakes um, ranging from southern Peru all the way up to Ecuador. And the E here marks the extinction according to falling below 2% of the gray curve. And the gray curve is the um, percentage of sporomyella in the record. The red line is the concentration of sporomyella in the record and the black bars here represent charcoal. So we've got some rather different stories here. So certainly the, the story isn't always the same as a Pacucha. A Caceracocha, it looks like we get an extinction event that's quite early and has nothing to do with charcoal. The charcoal doesn't come in until considerably later. At Winyamarca, we have the loss of megafauna during a sediment hiatus. Isn't that always the way? But we have sediment until um, about 19,000 years ago, and then we have a gap until about um, eight or 9,000 years ago, and somewhere in that time, we lose the megaphone. So we can't say a whole lot about it other than it's in that window. At um, Pacucha, we've talked about already, and at Yavuku, the story is quite different. So here, we've actually extended this record back to about 16,000 years now. And we have charcoal and sporomyella in that record going back to 16,000 years. And it, this valley gets about 3,000 millimeters of rain a year. It's really hard to conceive of this burning. And so um, it's, to me, it's very likely that people lived in this landscape alongside the animals without causing extinction for several thousand years, but then we get the extinction in this record appears to be at about 12,000, uh, 12.5 thousand years ago. The last one down here um, has an, another record from Chochos, has another record where we get an extinction which really doesn't relate very strongly uh, to fire. So overall, what we think is happening is that climate was driving 
these species down and probably had driven species, these megafauna into smaller and smaller populations with each interglacial. We've had 20 or so of these interglacials. And certainly during the five last strong ones, these megafauna populations probably become much smaller, but then they recover during some portion of the glacial period, except this time they didn't. And the reason being that we had the added pressure from human hunters. And so I think that the, this is a roller coaster that these animals were on. And it just so happened that there was this additional pressure just took them out of the landscape entirely this one time, giving us the extinction event. We sometimes hear the um, analogy of the American megafauna to the Serengeti or something like that. It's, it's a very colorful image, but I don't think it's very accurate, certainly in South America. I think here, these animals are always rather rare. And uh, I don't have time to sort of get into the full rationale behind that, but I, but I think that if you're drawing an analogy, it would be better to think of this relatively rare isolated Asian animals, things like the Indian elephant as opposed to the herd animals of Africa, right? or Banteng cattle, which are small family group animals of Asian rainforest, as opposed to wildebeest and, great, and zebra on the Great Plains. So I, I think that's just a, a more helpful analogy as we think about the impact of these animals. Okay, so I've talked a bit about humans as possibly uh, coming in early, possibly causing the extinction of the megafauna. What we do know is that they became cultivators in the Andes. And the real uptick in cultivation seems to happen a, around about five and a half thousand years ago. Um, and from there on, we see um, lots of evidence of, of people cultivating crops. So as we look at this, then we can, we can see that we've got a human signature here, which we know to be human, where we've got maize, we've got uh, uh, quinoa in the landscape, lots of fire in the landscape, and then possibly towards the top of Bacucha, this actually becomes so deforested that we lose some of that, that charcoal signature. So I do want to talk about that fire in the landscape, because as, as we saw there, it, it's a continuous thing from 15,000 years ago um, at Pacucha. In refugio, in uh, records which are at the top of the Manu transect, we see <coughs> a slightly different story. We see Polylepis as an important player in these records until the red line there. The red line is a sedimentary hiatus. So basically before 12,000 years ago, we've got some sedimentary record here. Then we have a gap in sedimentary record from about 12,000 years ago to about 4,000 years ago when the lakes just dry up. And then we pick up the story again on the top side of that. And we see that polylepis is really only found in the older sediments here below that hiatus. If we look above the hiatus, what we see is charcoal. This is almost certainly people who are occupying the top of this ridge and are burning it fairly regularly. And in so doing, they burn out the polylepis. It can't survive this much fire. We also see a transition towards more grassland in this landscape. And so this is sort of in line with thinking of the high Andes as a manufactured landscape, manufactured by people and fire um, over millennia. The mid-Holocene dry event uh, is a sort of a defining event. For a, that's why those lakes went dry. And we see Lake Titicaca drops its volume by about 50% at that time. It's the, it's the biggest change in lake volume and lake area at Titicaca in 100,000 years all happening between 9,000 and 5,000 years before present. During that same time period, we see the Atacama, uh, the Highland Atacama area becomes depopulated. There's just an archeological silence through this entire period. There's no archeological impacts up there. It's just too dry for people to live there. But before we think about this as being just this sort of um, entire South America all becoming dry at this time, it's more complicated than that. If we go 
into our region, we've just seen refugio lakes go dry. But Lake Miski, which is a nearby lake, just but one which faces more to the north and gets a more direct input of Amazonian moisture, that stayed wet. Lake Pacucha becomes shallower but stays wet. And so we have this mixed but much reduced signal of the dry event by the time we get to sort of our region. And if you go a bit further north up to the Hunin area, there is almost no effect at all from mid Holocene dry event. So this is really astonishing to me that you can have the strongest drought of 100,000 years impacting a big section of the Altiplano and, and the Atacama, but it is essentially a local condition. And so um, the, the cause of that still needs some, some more work, but it's undoubtedly to do with moisture being funneled across uh, the Amazon plain, recycled, um, but as the warming of, of the mid Holocene pushed the South Atlantic, the uh, intertropical convergence south, it moved this sort of center of where the precipitation was falling and it, it caused a, a change in the system. So we need to do a lot more work to understand this. I don't think anybody really understands the mid Holocene dry event properly, uh, but I think it's important to understand that it has a definite center that is sort of the Bolivia basically and that other regions are not in fact impacted nearly as, to the same extent. One of the consequences of um, the mid Holocene dry event was that it um, does have the potential to increase fire in the landscape. Now people are probably the ones providing the spark but anytime it's dry it's easier for the fire to carry and Brian Valencia got interested in thinking about this from the perspective of um, whether polylepis would survive in locations which were more heterogeneous in their terrain. So what catchments that have cliffs or that are sort of more structural uh, topographically, he thought might have microrefugia because of fire breaks within uh, the catchment. So he did an analysis where he looked at the rugosity of landscape and he, so he took each basin, did a sort of GIS calculation of how, um, what the terrain roughness was within each, each basin. These are just some examples. And then applied it to some of our lake records where we know that polylepis either survived the mid Holocene or didn't. And so what we see on the left here is if we had um, high terrain roughness within the basin, then the polyleaf, polylepis statistically would survive. Whereas if we had flatter basins with, with less terrain roughness, we lost the polylepis during the Holocene. And so this is, a, as I say, a sort of twofold explanation. One is that you have um, mini cliffs that act as fire breaks that can protect the polylepis population that's growing on top of them, uh, scree slopes, uh, will stop fire and so on. And so that's how we get modern woodlots of polylepis and he's just applying this over sort of a longer time period. This is not to say that each individual woodlot survived for thousands of years. This could be moving within the basin in terms of where the fire just happens not to occur for a while. The other side of this, the second factor here, is that the flatter basins were probably more popular with people. And so they probably had a bigger population density <coughs> more likely to, um, to induce fire and more likely to de deforest the area. Nikki Mosbleck um, did some work looking at crops and the, the uh, cultivation of Andean lakes. And she worked um, on Lake Waipo, which is just outside Cusco. And it's, today it's a saline lake, um, but in the past it was it supported uh, cultivation for quite a long time. And she produced a paper where she compared Waipo, Marcococha, which is another nearby lake, with the record from Pacucha. And so in this diagram, we've clustered the, sorry, we've clustered quinoa across three sites and clustered corn across three sites. And what we see is that the quinoa was, the, was an early crop uh, it's a pseudo cereal, of course, it's not a true cereal, 
but it's got a higher protein content than corn, it doesn't have as much sugar in it as corn. And I think it demonstrates that our sweet tooth will always win. And so um, corn took over from the super superfood of quinoa. So quinoa is much better for you. But um, because corn was used more for possibly for ceremonial drinks and for creating alcohol initially, it became a, a stronger dietary component. And between about 3,200 and 2,800 years ago, in this portion of Peru, we see this shift out of quinoa and into maize agriculture. Again, it'll be interesting to see how this holds up over a, a larger area, but certainly within, we've had one more site now uh, that we've done within this region and we see a, a similar pattern here. Uh, we did a, a study um, along the tree line at the top of Manu to try and look at how the tree line had changed through time. And so uh, a bunch of people on this call did a hike where we walked um, about 15 miles along the top of this, this ridge. And at random locations, we would drop off and we would um, collect soil pit samples from the tree line and then from just inside the forest and just inside the puna. And when my interest was to look at the organic horizon, we collected a sample from the top of the organic horizon and then one right from the bottom of the most you know, organic rich layer, the bottom of the A horizon. We radiocarbon dated those, and then we looked at the pollen and the charcoal in them. And so the idea was if we, we thought going into this, what we would see is that forest had been replaced by puna as fire eroded the forest down slope. And so if that was the case, we'd expect to see uh, puna on top and forest underneath uh, in those soil pits. Conversely, if forest had moved up slope, we would expect to see um, puna on top and, so, and sorry, we see forest on top and puna underneath. So most of the soil pits that we dug um, had uh, a base age of between two and 3,000 years. And so that we've got that is our sort of window of comparison then. And this is what the modern pollen data looks like. So if it's in the Puna, you do have a bit of windblown forest pollen that gets up there, but most of it is um, grass pollen and other uh, clearly Puna pollen types. We have a transition zone, which is uh, more mixed. And then we have the forest zone, which has got mostly forest pollen, but it certainly gets some grass pollen blowing down into it, which is a little surprising to see as much going downslope because the prevailing wind is, is definitely upslope. Uh, but the F to P ratio on the side shows you the forest pollen ratio of the modern system. So we did some statistics on the pairs. And if I just show you the, the pairs of modern and fossil, they actually look very similar. And so there isn't a lot to, to look at in that diagram. But if you break it out into a Procrustes rotation of a DCA analysis, then what we see here is the, each arrow represents the, the old sample of the base of the arrow going toward the modern at the tip of the arrow. And so basically this represents about 2000 years, 3000 years of change in each of these things. And the direction of the arrow uh, gives you the direction of the sample. So all the long arrows tell you there's been more change than the short arrows. And we see that the forest taxa have got the long arrows. So the forest has changed more than the puna or the transition. And the forest has changed almost always from more foresty towards transition. In other words, it's getting less deep forest signature about it, if you like. It's getting more transitional. But curiously, the, the puna is also trending towards the transitional. And so um, this sets up our, an observation that we think that, the, that is to do with fire. And the charcoal record here is also interesting. On the left is the modern charcoal, and in the middle is the paleo charcoal from the bottom of the soil pit. And then 
there's one minus the other is the right hand column. And basically the take home message is there's a lot more fire or at least a lot more charcoal in the modern samples than there was in the paleo samples, especially in the Puna. And I think that, that the explanation for that goes towards why the Puna was tracking towards the transitional. In other words, what's happening is the Puna is being invaded by woody taxa, making it look more transitional. Those woody taxa, when they burn, provide charcoal. Grass, when it burns, really doesn't. And so I think that um, that's really what's going on, is that we're getting a signature of change in the Puna reflecting the invasion of this sort of forest edge Puna by woody taxa. And I put this in to remind me to tell you that all of this fire, almost all of it, is going to be human induced. Right? It's be we've got very few records of natural fires that start naturally and propagate far in these systems. So our summary then, after I put it into a cartoon, is that we might have started two or 3,000 years ago with a fairly sharp transition between forest and Puna. We don't see much of a, a transition zone at that time. But if we come through to the modern times, we get more fire in the system, more fire which erodes down slope. It runs into the top of the forest, making that less foresty and more transitional. And at the same time, probably anthropogenic climate change is driving the upslope expansion of some woody taxa so that they colonize the, the, a portion of the, um, of the Puna, uh, which then burns and they provide the char. So I think we've got this tension then between um, the upslope migration of species versus the, uh, down, the pressure downwards of, of the fire we're actually seeing that in these paleo records. So, so far I've talked a lot about humans as sort of controlling fire, changing the system. It's being a, a, a manufactured landscape to a large extent in the high Andes. This is a contrasting study. This is from Lake Palatoa. And so many of you have been down the, the Palatoa River or, or um, or at least come across it as you've been going down um, towards the, the lowlands. And the, this is one of our more extreme expeditions that we ran to get into this. I think Miles saw the, the lake first on some um, satellite imagery or some aerial imagery, and we got excited about it because it looked to us to be exactly the same situation as Lake Consuelo. And so we were hoping that we would go here and we'd find a, another 40,000 year old lake. And so we mounted an expedition. Uh, it was mostly undergraduates from Florida Tech. There was Miles uh, in there at the back and um, one of his uh, undergrads came along as well. And it was, it was pretty rugged. This, we, this is fording across the uh, Palatoa River and our goal was to get behind that ridge, which is in the background of the picture. It took two days to hike in there. Um, we had to go past uh, semi-contacted Indians, had to get them to clear out their village so we didn't infect them as we went through. One of the kids here got nailed by a dog as we were going through there, you know, drew blood and everything. And so <laughs> we poured whiskey on it and, and said, well, we're too far away to get your rabies vaccination. So we just have to hope for the best. And uh, luckily that one worked out. And eventually we got up to the lake and it really was an, an unusual setting. It was sort of nestled down in a bowl. And uh, when we started coring, it was disappointing. We got a meter of sediment. We'd had, I think it was eight meters out of Consuela. We got one meter of sediment out of this before we got down to a sandy layer. Um, this lake undoubtedly had dried out during the mid Holocene dry event. This was not a deep enough. It was only three meters deep. It wasn't deep enough to, um, survived that drying and the lake record turned out to be only 3,000 years old and so it went on the back burner for a while but as we became more interested in human impacts so um, I got Jake Schifferl to work on it and so one of the, one of the 
interesting things about this lake in hindsight was that this flora was really unusual. So on the ridge, there's Dictyocarium, closer to the lake, there are um, other, other palms um, here, but the, the dominant palm on the ridge was this Dictyocarium, which is a lot like Iriatia for those who aren't familiar with it. And so I've just arrowed all the canopies that we can identify here in this image as being Dictyocarium. It's really, really dense. And so, you know, immediately we are thinking about, well, is this one of these oligarchs that has arrived recently? You know, can we tell anything about it at all from the paleo record? And that's where Jake Schiffel comes in. He did his masters looking at this record. And um, over here, this is the Dictyocarium curve. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this pond diagram. There's just two things I want to point out. This Dictyocarium, actually Dictyocarium <coughs> used to be more abundant than it is today. And this here is Hediosmum increasing. And Hediosmum increases as Dictyocarium actually decreases. And we also talk about the reason for that in just a minute. Oh, let me just go back to this. The reason I said this is a contrasting record is there is no charcoal and there are no people anywhere evident in this record. This record looks to be a complete, completely pure um, uh, climatic record. Now, these little cartoons were developed by Jake to explain what was going on here. And it's contrasting how lower montane and pre-montane floras sort of mix at this elevation. We're we're sitting at 1,380 meters elevation and uh, is fed by moisture coming out of the Amazon forest that uh, pushes up slope to form a cloud base. And so we are really close to that cloud base. I, I think that William was talking about it at 1,500 meters elevation. Um, here, I think it's really just about where this lake is. Um, and as that cloud base moves up and down slope in response to changing moisture availability, so the flora is going to change because one of the things that William and Miles have shown is that the biggest floral turnover is where you have this cloud base. And so at the lake, we can think of this as being a mixture often, or all the time, is a mixture of either the lower montane with the pre-montane. And it's really just a question of how that cloud base is moving up and down as to the relative proportions of these things. So as the uh, cloud base moves down slope because it's got cooler or it's got wetter, so you have more of the lower montane. As you get um, the cloud base shifting up slope, so you get an increase in the, in the pre-montane. And so that goes up. It doesn't mean to say that this whole group is disappearing, you know, it's not a sharp line. It's just the shifting proportion of these things in this tension zone between what we characterize as pre-montane and lower montane. So essentially, if we see cool and or wet, we're going to see a bias towards the um, lower montane. If we see warm and or dry, we're going to see a bias towards the pre-montane. Now to go back to Jake's data set. This is the Dictyocarium now plotted from older through to modern. And uh, in this panel here, we have things which we are definitely going to ascribe to being lower montane taxa, things which we can definitely ascribe to being pre-montane taxa. There's a whole mess of things in the middle here, which um, are, are neither one thing nor the other. They, they could easily be from, from either. But what we do see as we look across this diagram is that there is an increase in lower montane taxa here um, at, corresponding to the onset of the medieval climate anomaly. The, the medieval climate anomaly is marked by a, the start of a trend towards wetter conditions in, sorry, in isotopic records, which is what's going on here. At the top, these two red lines are uh, isotopic records, one from a cave and one from a lake. And from about 700 years ago onwards, the situation is getting wetter. And so we have sort of peak wetness occurring during the blue bar here, which is the Little Ice Age. And sure enough, 
in terms of the pollen, we don't see a big difference between the medieval climate anomaly and the Little Ice Age. So the medieval climate anomaly marks a transition in the Andes from a sort of a drier system into a wetter system. But the Little Ice Age really has very little impact in this section of the Andes, as far as we can tell at present. The last thing that I want to talk about is some work that I've been doing with Crystal McMichael. It started with her PhD work in <coughs> the lowland Amazon. And um, this map of Amazonia shows the black is where there's a lot of evidence of people. And this is terra preta, this is these modified soils that, that people created to increase productivity. Um, it's, charcoal data and various other things are shown here but basically you can see that people hug the rivers to a large extent and at least that's going into now was that just sampling um bias because that's where people have looked in the past or were they genuinely genuinely living along the rivers and why do we see so little evidence of these things in the western amazon is it just because people didn't look so crystal did a sort of randomized study uh in the western amazon she dug 400 soil pits at 120 locations and asked the basic question, how much terra preta am I gonna find? And how many artifacts am I gonna find? Pottery sherds and so on, which are very common in these Eastern Amazonian soils. And the answer to that was none. So all those white squares are her sample sites. And this included Cochicachu and Los Amigos. And she didn't find any of these classic uh, signatures of intensive occupation. But that's not the same thing as saying there was no human impacts there. What she did find was that some of these uh, soil cores that she was taking with an auger contained charcoal. And we were able to date individual charcoal fragments and therefore date the fire. And from that, um, we could also look to see what the frequency of those fires was, or the frequency of probability of finding charcoal in a soil pit. And we, the strongest relationship we found in all of that was a, an exponential decay curve going away from rivers. So people lived along the rivers, they burnt the forest close to the river, and basically by the time you got 10 kilometers away from the river, it was very unlikely to have been burned. That's a day's walk. So this makes sense. P if people were living along the rivers, that they really wouldn't be exploiting the forest near as much further away from the river. And it fits very well with Carlos Perez's hunting data and so on, which shows you know, strong hunting impacts within three kilometers of the river and basically you're back down to the background levels at 10 kilometers from a river. Entirely independently derived, but basically coming to the same conclusion. The fire histories though, within forest plots is very important for us to, to think about succession or carbon storage and all those things and we crystal's uh, got an ongoing project where she's going to go into a, a bunch of these forest plots that are used for forest inventory work to actually assess um, when did they last burn and so here's just some uh, contrasting data this is from a paper that she and her student Britta Hijink put out um, in, in general biogeography this year so Amakayaku in Colombia had a couple of fire events, but nothing in the last 3,000 years. If you look at the BDFF plots around Manaus, they have a lot of fire in them. And that fire basically um, comes through almost until the modern times. Perhaps there's, there's a sort of a bit less of it about after a thousand years or so ago. These, I should say that these are cumulative probability distributions of, um, of radiocarbon ages. And so, for example, the Cochicashi one, which shows two big spikes, that's actually two tiny fragments of charcoal, the only two fragments of charcoal big enough to date in 40 soil cores from Cochicashi. And each of those ages has a probability distribution, which is what is being graphed here. So it's not that you've got multiple um, fire events, you've just got two fragments that could have possible solutions in terms of the radiocarbon age. But you see that uh, Cochicashu burned at about 1,200 years ago and burned at about seven to 800 years ago. Los Amigos has got a different signature. It actually burns a lot more 
than Kerch Akashi. It's got quite frequent fires in its history, but the last of them until the very recent times was a thousand years ago. We, we looked at these charcoal data as crystals generating them, and it was coming together in our heads with data that we were seeing from the fossil pollen records of places in northern Peru, in Ecuador, that there was not a wall of fire in these forests until the time of European contact. These, this is a heterogeneous use of landscape. It was a patchy use of landscape. But in fact, there is very little evidence of people in these systems after about a thousand years ago. And so if you take the 10 best pollen records we've got for the Amazon basin, and you take a, their mean, in each record you take the mean of the forest abundance of the pollen, and then you plot each time step as being you know, the deviation from the mean, and then you superimpose them. So this is basically the same thing as doing the hockey stick. And then you take a, a mean of, of the 10 sites. This is what you get. And so this is an ADBC um, scale. So this is 0 AD through to modern. And here we have what we call the great dying by some people. So this is the period from 1550 to 1700 when it's believed that 95 the, the human population of Amazonia fell by 95% due to European disease, enslavement, warfare, all kinds of nasty things going on at that time for indigenous people. The, I, the argument has been that this was a time of massive forest regrowth in the Amazon basin, and that it may even have triggered the deepening of the Little Ice Age and the, uh, the loss of, of, or the sequestration of carbon from the atmosphere at 1600, which is a known event. We see absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever in Amazonia. Amazonia is the biggest forest or the most productive forest system, the only one which is likely to have generated that kind of carbon uptake uh, in the new world, and we don't see evidence for it. Instead, what we see is an uptick in forest somewhat more subtle than that we would need for that, but it's, it, it's not at the right time period. It's back at about 1200. And it, in fact, you know, some forests are showing us from about 800 AD onwards. And so we haven't explained what is causing this yet, but uh, we don't rule out earlier waves of disease. We don't rule out uh, social conditions changing, um, but we certainly don't believe that there is a mass of deforestation and reforestation coincident with the Great Dying. I think that's just a, uh, a convenient fiction. So my take home messages, fire is and has been the transformative agent of these systems. It's not natural in most of these systems. Um, we find fire strongly associated with human engagement. Uh, humans have been influencing these systems for at least 13,000 years, perhaps as much as 16,000 years. The megafaunal dis decline and extinction is a multi-step process. It looks like it's initially a climate-based decline with an actual extinction probably around about 12,500 years ago that is human-induced. Um, where burning is easy, the disturbance is the greatest. And so it's easier to burn the highlands or the dry lowlands than it is the ACs or lowlands. And so we can expect to see uh, human impacts sort of on that, you know, following that scale, following that trajectory of uh, seasonality. Um, the period of occupation and of where we see strong changes in the landscape differs a little between the highlands and the lowlands. We have really widespread cultivation and pastoralism evident between 5,000 and 4,000 years ago in the highlands. In the lowlands, it becomes evident between 3,000 and 2,000 years ago. But again, um, I think it's more restricted in the lowlands probably than it was in the highlands. Just as today, wet and really remote places are difficult and unpleasant to work in, 
so they were difficult and unpleasant places to be in the past. And so I think, you know, again, people would have chosen to be in the best locations, not in the crummiest ones. And so somewhere which floods eight meters deep is just a, a bad place to live. Right? So um, as we think about whether we're likely to have a system which has been transformed by human behavior in the past, um, if it's a, a, a route of commerce, if it's a sort of honeypot location of just being a great place to be, if it's on a river, on a confluence of valleys, something which is of strategic importance, expect there to have been people there. On the other hand, if you're in the terra firma more than 10 kilometers away from a river, it's probably pretty unlikely that people had much of an impact. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Mark. That was terrific. You said that touched on such a range of things. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm, I'm probably t satisfied no one and, and pissed off absolutely everyone. But anyway, we'll see. Do you, do you want to stop sharing? And we'll, we'll open up to. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would if I had my glasses. Oh, this is awful. Stop sharing. All right, I know. Good. I've got to find my mouse first. Okay. Okay. We're still sharing, which you're off your slide, so. Okay, is that stopped? Okay, that's good, yeah. No, no. Okay, uh, very good. Terrific. Uh, okay, so we can open up to questions. Uh, I'll kick off with one, just to, uh, so uh, you suggested that you, on the megafauna, you suggested that South America never had hyperabundant megafauna the way Africa does. Uh, what's your reasoning for that? Why do you think that's the case? Um, we've also got data from previous interglacials and the megafauna uh, around the Titicaca Basin there, and I think Jake Schifferl is going to show us from the Hunin Basin as well, will show that these animals um, didn't actually ever, they, they were always on coming in or out of the glacial in terms of their, their occupation of the, of the highlands. They weren't there in the peak of the interglacial and they weren't there in the peak of the, of the glacial itself, right? So they were right on the cusp. There was a sweet spot for them to build a population. And then if you think about the area that is available to them, it was really small in the highlands because you either had ice caps wiping out the big intra-Andean valleys and they have been forced down onto the slopes of the Andes where there isn't very much real estate there really for them. Or um, they were coming up in the interglacials, but then the interglacials became too hot and arid for them. And so they didn't do well in the interglacials either. They, they, from our data, it just looks like they were always being pushed around by climate. They were never um, able to build big enough numbers that they could actually control fire, for example, by grazing the, the, the graze down. In the lowlands, in the forest, I mean, apart from that, we have almost no fossil evidence of them. Um, there's, you know, one or two bones of uh, elephantids and things in the entire Amazon lowlands. So um, it's, where would they have been? They were either going to be living in the forest, in which case they're going to be solitary forest animals, okapi-like or, or Indian elephant-like, or they had been in Vasea meadows. And the Vasea meadows didn't really exist when we had lowered sea level, because um, those things are, look like they're a fairly um, early Holocene uh, function of raising sea level. And that's when you get enough flooding coming back up the Amazon to, to give you those flood meadows. So, it's not a very satisfying answer, but um, I, we just don't see big, big st stable populations of them ever. I can, I can see John wanting to come in on that. Okay. Yeah, could I add a bit on that? I've, I've uh, had the pleasure of working in the African forest and in the Asian forest, and uh, it's true the the biomass density of, of large herbivores is considerably less than it would be in in Serengeti, even though the, the productivity is considerably higher, but it all goes into trees. And so in a, in a forest environment, you have only browsers and elephants are of course uh, uh, a major example. 
And so elephants are in all kinds of habitats and throughout history, there've been a, a browsing clade and a, a grazing clade of, of proboscideans, elephant-like creatures. Um, but uh, forests are just gonna have only browsers. So you're never gonna see the, the high density of, of large herbivorous mammals in, in a forest environment. So I'm wondering whether some of those uh, things that, that that period of very low uh, 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 mega herbivore by uh, the the sporomela um, uh, in the uh, what about twelve thousand years ago you said or maybe mm -hmm. it was sixteen I don't remember the exact dates yeah. but uh, could that be due just to advance of more forested environments that would have kept out the grazing element of the megafauna? It. Um... It, it could certainly be a sort of turnover of these things. Um, yes, so the Yavuku data is a forested valley, and we, we see very low abundances of the megafauna there ever. You know, it, it, they barely break 3% of the pollen some there. So it's telling us that these, these were always sort of forest, woodland limited animals. In the grassland settings of southern Peru, though, we, we see, um, we see much higher percentages, which would be consistent with, with larger populations on the grasslands, but they absolutely disappear before the forest comes in. And they disappear in the areas which are today um, Puna grassland, which would never have had forest. Before so, people or after people? Um, in, in some cases, before people. So that's not saying that they go extinct, extinct. They just, they drop out of our record to the point where we can't detect them. So their populations are reduced. Well, it was a fascinating talk. Uh, I, I, really, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I have one more question, <laughs> if I, if I uh, don't want to monopolize this, but uh, I'm, just, I'm still sort of baffled at the scarcity of, of evidence for human occupation in Western Amazonia. It's, it's, it's the most productive part of Amazonia. It, it has high, uh, high animal densities compared to central and eastern. I mean, Carlos has shown that very well. I mean, the richest animal faunas are in West Amazonia. Uh, the fishing's good in the rivers. Why, why weren't there people there? I, that's very strange. Well, I think there were people. They were, but they weren't dense populations and they weren't farmers. Mm -hmm. They, um, you know, anything which floods is not going to be a great habitat for them. And of course, we've got one hand tied behind our back in, t in terms of detecting them because there's no stone there. So they can't build stone structures that we can see, you know, in the, in the Andes and other places. So archaeologists are doing really interesting work where they are trying to detect um, post holes and, and all these other things. But, I'll, you know, Mike Heckenberger has done great work down in the Shingu and there they do have um, earthworks and things to show things going on. But there is, there is earthworks down on the Bolivian fringe of the Amazon. But in what I think of as true Amazonian rainforest, there, there's almost nothing evident there. The only way we're detecting it is through charcoal uh, and, and occasionally finding lakes where there's maize cultivation and things. But it, it's, it doesn't look to us um, to be anything like the density that you have in the central Amazon or in the southern, southern Amazon. If I had that map where you contrasted the terra pressure in the east with crystal sampling in the west, yeah. are you implying there that, that much of that contrast is simply the sampling bias in the east where everything is sampled near rivers and this random sampling that crystal did? Is, well, yeah. we've done enough sampling along rivers now to show that, that we're not getting terra preta. I think it was You've got lots of different cultures across the Amazon through time as well, of course, and they adapted differently to the different settings. And I think that the adaptations, the cultural adaptations to develop terra preta were different from the cultural adaptations for people to build the geoglyphs in the south. They don't overlap either. And then you've got the Western Amazon seems to be yet another sort of cultural block where maybe they were fishers. And they, they weren't really um, living in the forest in the same way that the, the people who are cultivating and doing the terra press. And, you know, and just uh, uh, the only eyewitness account we've got of this is Carver Hall's account when he goes down the river with Oriana 
1541, and they starve. They're eating their leather bucklers in Peru and Ecuador. They only get fed, really, when they get into Brazil. And, and so, um, you know, just if you just take that at face value, it certainly suggests that the headwaters of the Napo and so on, those just weren't occupied at that time. Okay. So I've actually got an NSF proposal sitting in there right now. If any of you re review it, be very kind. Um, and one of the things we want to do is to sort of ground truth that Carvajal account to go down and look at the, the lakes along the rivers there in the Napo to say, was there cultivation there? Were they just missing it? Or were they lying through their teeth um, so that they didn't get beheaded when they got back home again? Because <laughs> you know? they, they disobeyed direct order to, to return back to um, Pizarro. And so he'd given them all the weapons. He told, told them to go down, look for 10 days downstream for food and then come back. And they just kept going. They were looking for El Dorado. And so, you know, was it, was all this sort of hardship just, you know, crocodile tears so they, they could appear to have the sort of the pity element or was it genuinely that they were that, that stressed? We don't know. Okay, uh, anybody else got questions? Hello, I have a question. Sure. I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Hear me. Okay, um, I'm Julia, I'm from the Enquis lab, I'm a postdoctor. Um, and I was curious about when you are talking about the tree line going up to the Puna and that woody species are moving up a slope, but at the same time the tree line is eroded by fire. I was wondering if those species that are colonizing, like moving up the slope, if those are having like traits uh, adapted to fire. So if these kind of traits are more abundant in those species yeah. that are going up the slope. That's a fabulous question. We haven't, haven't done that analysis. Um, we thought of them as being sort of trashy species, weedy species. And so my guess is yes. That they are, they're, they, that they would show traits that are either fire-resistant traits, or at least are capable of sort of being pioneers following fire. But we we haven't done that actual analysis, and I think that to be honest, um, we would need to do a more detailed pollen analysis to try to really drill down to the genus, maybe even the species level for some of those things before we could answer that properly. But I think. If you, if you sort of say, okay, the pollen study sets a hypothesis, now let's go and test it with some real ecological data in the field, that'd be a better way to do it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank, thank you. A very nice talk, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Okay, any, any other questions? Can I just ask about the mid-Holocene dry event? Man, I knew you'd come back with something. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was great, Mark. I really enjoyed it. And maybe sometime if we have a lot of time, I'll tell, I'll tell some of the stories from the Palatoa trip. <laughs> but, um, the, so the pattern that you saw with it, with it kind of decaying is, is really interesting. And it fits exactly the gamma diversity of forests, whether you're up in high elevation or all the way out in the lowland, it's the same. And it tails off starting at about 11 or 12 degrees, maybe 10 degrees, which is Hunin. And I just wondered if, you know, if you think about the, the cause of the monsoon, you know, at a simple level, it's just you, you either have an intensification or a deintensification due to precession. And, and so if you're just kind of making the monsoon smaller, I don't know if Yadvinder can answer this or somebody, but you, know, you might expect it to, to dry out more at the margins than in the center. But I don't. I'm sure there are better people on this call to answer that, that, that or comment on that. I mean, I think the position of Bolivian high is also going to be a big factor in this, uh, which is something I've never truly understood what drives that to, to move and change in intensity. Um, but also just the funneling of moisture across the Amazon basin. Um, there's a paper, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the author now, came out talking about rivers of air coming across and showing very nicely that this sort of cell, which is right where the Aberg transect is, is the most susceptible to changes in Atlantic moisture. Hmm. 
um, just because uh, it, um, other cells rely more on the convective cycling of moisture across the Amazon basin. But just as you get down at that break, as you go to, towards Titicaca, that, that little location there is the most sensitive. And so if you shut down anything across the Eastern Amazon, if you interfered with moisture transport across the Eastern Amazon there, and that recycling of moisture, you would also be affecting that area there. And so there's this whole idea about the East-West anti-phasing of what's going on. And so it may be that actually, if you look at what's happening in, in the Eastern Amazon, it's whilst it's anti-phased to the Western Amazon, it's not anti-phased to where we are. It could be actually directly related. We just don't have the speleothem data to show that. That was a really awful explanation, but I mean, um, so if anyone is the climatey people here, maybe William's got better understanding this than I do. But it's a tremendous, you know, talking about Amazonian drought, I've always thought like there's just the low hanging fruit is we had a dry event that is way greater than anything we're experiencing now. And yeah. we have these bits and pieces of the forest effect and we have these natural gradients. Like we could, you could, you could study what the analog is of the Amazonian forest under drought. Yeah, I cut out a slide or two, which I was going to talk about a lake, which is Miski, which is, um, uh, it, it's, it's on the, the, the turn of the Andes, just that faces north. And it, it's a much greener location than Refugio on the top of Manu. So, you know, it it's, gets more moisture. It's just always wetter up there. It's just really soggy. And those lakes didn't dry out. They're only at eight meters deep, and they've got moisture all the way through at that mid Holocene dry event. And so um, it, it's all, I think it's a function of how the moisture was delivered and where it was delivered is, is also a big part of that story. Very cool. Okay, any more questions from anyone? And uh, feel free to switch on your videos, everyone, as well. It's nice to, nice to see faces as well. I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask about, um, I thought it was really cool how you presented on the, uh, the dynamics and the tension that's happening at, um, at Forest Tree Line with Puna. And do you think that there would be kind of similar dynamics as we go north and you start to get from um, Puna into Paramo, like the forest Paramo transition would be under kind of similar pressures and dynamics between those, those habitats? Um. That would be really interesting to look at. It would also be incredibly hard panologically to sort that out because we are so limited. When it comes to grasses, we can't tell the grasses apart very well or at all. Um, but maybe phytoliths would be a, a good tool to use for, for looking at some of those things. Like maybe there's some signatures in there that Crystal and her group could look at. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's we, there is definitely a suggestion that around about 11 degrees north, just where Miles was talking about, that there's um, a sort of tipping point in the system there in terms of how uh, the system responds north or south of, of about 11 degrees in terms of whether it's in phase or out of phase with the, the, the Caribbean records there. And um, so it's definitely possible. Absolutely. So you're thinking about birds? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, right. Just kind of thinking about that, the importance of that ecotone and how that might change as we're going, as we're going north in the Andes. Um, and historically, what kinds of factors were, were kind of governing that, that transition zone? Yeah, I mean, I think we don't know what the natural vegetation of the Puna or the Paramo is. That's the other side of this. But they're both these yeah. <laughs> landscapes. Right? And so um, the woodland yeah. cover, where the polylepis was a, uh, you know, a more unifying thing in the past, in, in, at least in terms of bird habitat than today, maybe. Don't know. So just going back to that, so prior to human settlement and the spread of fire. What do, what do the paleo records say about what the, the highland environment was like? You, you had a, there's no analog system for a while 
Right. Okay. And then as it, as it breaks out of that, we go straight into a human dominated system. So I would argue that the, the Holocene in the Highlands has always been a human dominated system. We've never seen a natural vegetation up there. We have, we're going to have to go back to MIS 11 or something like that to try and see what the closest analog ought to be. Mm. But I mean, I, I think that's a sort of the purest talking. I, I think that what we do see when we have less fire in that landscape is more polylepis than we see today. Do I think it was a, just a you know a wall to wall polylepis woodland? No, I'm sure it wasn't. I, I think that it may have been a sort of a shrubland with with polylepis as a more important member of of it, and genoxis and these other things probably uh, more important than they are today. Not just into these little clustered fire free locations they have today, but just more scattered across the landscape. And then I'm sure there was natural fire in the system to some extent. And so ridge tops, places which catch lightning and which are likely to spread lightning were probably much grassier. But we, it's a genuine problem for us that the, the people come in so quickly that we never get a chance to see what the natural Holocene is. Hey, Mark, I have a question. Yeah. Hey, William. Great talk. It was fantastic. Um, speaking of this transition zone, do you think, um, I mean, thinking like for conservation of all that, that will act when you, you say when you have this lot of fuel, like these woody species, will be this fuel for the fires, right? And for example, in the protected areas where you exclude the fires, you have yeah. this natural regeneration of the forest or upslope migration on these woody species. Right. Then you have this fire band, and then you have the fuel. So you think the natural fires will be limiting this tree line, and it will be like a time series frame? So more or less like a Serengeti, but in the long time dynamics? Oh, I, I think I see. Um, so tree line, of course, was responding to temperature in, in the distant past. And so, you know, as ice ages come and go. So the tree line would have been being pushed up and down slope, but it probably wasn't exactly as we see it today. Some species would be responding faster, some slower, and, and so you'd have this mixture. And then if it stabilizes to some extent, then you'd, then you'd establish tree line. But I think the, the sort of artificial or, or the hard boundary of a tree line is maybe a bit of an artificial construct created by past management, um, you know. So I, I don't know if I just answered your question or not, but I, I see it as being a very movable feast in the past that the, the tree line or the upper limit of where trees will grow has a, has a physiological component to it, but it'll be different for every species. I'm not sure, and, and where fire would naturally occur in the Andes, um, that we simply, I, I don't think we know. The data that we've got from Titicaca and the data that we're getting from Hunin, where we've got 600,000 year record, we've got six interglacials or something in there, we can look at what we're seeing is fire is really rare. It, it, even in interglacials in the past, it was a, a rare thing. It's there, so it could structure vegetation but it's not, it's nothing like as common as it, as it is today. And I don't know what the fire interval period is, whether it's 200 years, 500 years, or a thousand years. But it's, it's, it looks to me like it's on that order of magnitude rather than three to 10 years, which is what we're seeing today. Okay, any more questions? Uh, so uh, turning to, to the, uh, the Great Dying, or, or actually this, uh, this decline that you see around 1200, uh, any hypotheses or speculation about what, what was happening around 1200 that could have caused right. that? Wild arm waving. Um, I, I think the Western Amazon was getting wetter, which made it an unpleasant place to be, more unpleasant than it had been before. 
Um, it, uh, there were bigger flood events at that time. And so that could be part of the story. Um, so some areas were just marginal and I think they were being abandoned because of it. Mm. There's also the possibility that there were outbreaks of disease through there. So the Wari in the highlands, really ex they took pastoralism to a new level and they extended an empire into areas where there hadn't been a whole lot of pastoralism before. And so Warren Church, who's an archeologist, has, he and I have chatted about this and, you know, in, in Rum, he will, he will tell me that he thinks that maybe zoonotic disease is tracked with the Wari as they expanded their empire, which is about 800 AD. And is so- not, Is it based on, on llamas or what's, what's the- Yeah, so they, they were you know, using llamas and alpaca. And so um, there's a possibility then that that sort of close animal husbandry, um, guinea pigs in the mix as well, of course, um, might have created some new diseases that could have um, invaded through trade down into the lowlands as well. Because we know there's lots of trade between the highlands and the lowlands uh, throughout time. And we can see you know, obsidian chips moving up and down slope, and we can see feathers moving up and down slope and, and, and so on. So there is lots of connectivity between the highlands and the lowlands. And so if there's disease in the highlands, it'll certainly get into the lowlands. We see there's the, there's a sort of a dark ages in the Andes, um, around about 800, 900 AD, when they had been living in the valleys and they move up onto ridge tops. And that is generally thought of as being a defensive posture. And the classic idea is that they were um, there's a lot of warfare at that time and, and people were living on ridge tops for defensive purposes. Today, you know, looking at disease, it makes me think, well, that would be how you control people coming into your community too. You go up onto the ridge top as a defensive thing against disease. And so I think it's entirely possible. And, and just a couple of weeks ago, you know, there's always data came out about how the Greenland population had smallpox way earlier and a different strain of smallpox than uh, currently exists. And so, you know, my flight of fantasy, Greenlanders took smallpox across the Americas early, it transferred down and it hit the Andes early. And, it, and so I, I, don't, I don't think that the great dying as a concept is necessarily wrong. I think it's just the wrong time period they're ascribing it to. And it may have been not this instantaneous thing, but just a rolled out across centuries across the Amazon basin. And then when the Europeans came in, of course, they, they just jacked it up even more where they were, which was along the major rivers. Absolutely. So that was a really long winded way of saying, I don't know. Great. <laughs> that's good. Lots of hypotheses thrown in there. Great. <laughs> okay. So uh, turning back to the, the beginning of the human period, uh, you were arguing that the decline in the megafauna about 16,000 years ago argues for human population. Well, so, you, the uh, increase in charcoal argues. For yeah, the increase in charcoal, yeah, okay, coinciding with that. Yeah. So I presume these recent couple of papers in Nature arguing for a strong and a quite early pre-COVID human presence in the Americas is quite consistent with, with, with this expectation that you're, you're getting there. What, what do you think? Yeah, I you know, last time we spoke, I hadn't seen those papers and I've taken a look at them now and they fall into the category of papers which have been around for a long time of unifacial tools. And a unifacial tool can't really be distinguished from a flake that falls off the roof of a cave. When you get bifacial or faceted tools where they've actually had more than one strike to, to create the tool, then you can be sure it's people. But so long as it's unifacial, there's unifacial tools from Brazil from 40,000 years ago, so-called. But basically a lot of people would just say, well, that's just bits of the roof falling off the cave. And the dating isn't convincing enough to tell me that, that you know, this is actually people doing this as opposed to anything else. So I'm, I'm sitting on the fence about that. I think I, I've got a degree of skepticism about it, but you know, 
uh, archaeologists have been wrong all the way along the line about human entry into the America. So why shouldn't they, why should they be right now? Yeah, I, I think on, on that study, I'm not convinced, but in general, an early entry into the Americas could well be. Okay, terrific. Uh, no more questions for anyone? Uh, okay. Thank you. That was fantastic, Mark. That was a real, real to the force. Of, uh, All right. Well, well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for making me think about this stuff and, and remembering a bunch of really exciting ex expeditions and miles. And I'm looking forward to doing more. <laughs> I think we should have a session where we just have recollections of uh, expedition tales from. from... <laughs> yeah, we you need a lot more alcohol, but yeah. That'd be good. yeah. Uh, uh, great. So we've got Jill in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, thanks for, for volunteering, uh, Jill. And uh, I think most of you are on the list, but if any of you, or if, any, if you want any of your postdocs or students or anything to, or other colleagues to be on this mailing list, just let me know and I, I'll add, I'll keep on adding names uh, uh, to this and I'll, I'll share the recording of, the, of this video uh, with everyone as well. All right, splendid, thank you. Yeah. See you that was all. great, that was a lot of fun. We could talk about this all night. That's terrific. Yeah. Pretty good. Terrific talk, Mark, absolutely terrific. Thank you, John. Take care, guys. Okay. Bye, everyone. See you guys.